she was born into a wealthy northern family in England and would succumb to four marriages throughout her life. Uprising and conflict though would always intervene, but she spent most of her time in London. Sadness would come to her on many occasions and one day the king himself came calling. Yet threats of prison and words of treason were never far away, but her religious beliefs would help guide her through. We now look at the life of Catherine Parr. Catherine Parr was the daughter of Sir Thomas Parr and his wife Maud Green, an English courtier. She was also very friendly and lady-in-waiting to Catherine of Aragon. Catherine's father was a descendant of Edward III, yet this northern family would gain a great significance over the coming years. Catherine had a younger brother and sister, William and Anne. Her father was close to Henry VIII, in which he had been significantly rewarded by the king. His several positions included Sheriff of Northamptonshire, Master of the Wards, and not forgetting Lord of Kendal. Her mother had been very close to Catherine of Aragon, and it's thought Catherine gained her name from the Queen, who was also her godmother. Catherine was born in 1512, it's thought around August time. It is disputed as to where she was born, some say at Kendal Castle. However, others doubt this as her mother Maud remained at court during her pregnancy. It's unlikely she would have travelled on a two-week journey north to give birth. The castle at Kendal was in quite a state of disrepair at the time, another reason for them to stay in London as they had a private residence at Blackfriars. Sadly for Catherine, her father died when she was still relatively young and it would be her mother who would bring her up. But she did a great job. Catherine's education was very similar to other children of the period and still her passion for learning was gratifying and she would continue to study throughout her life. She was excellent at languages, becoming proficient in French, Latin and Italian. She even learnt Spanish after becoming Queen, but some say she was not adept at everything taught in those early years. A hatred of sewing and needleworking, which she would explain to her mother. Her hands were ordained to touch crowns and scepters, not needles and spindles, although this is purely mythical in its origin. In 1529, when Catherine reached 17, she became married for the first time. Sir Edward Burr was the man for her. He was in his twenties, but unfortunately, this wouldn't be a happy ever after event. Edward suffered from ill health, and although he worked as a trustee and a justice of the peace to Thomas Kiddell, just four years after the couple married, Edward died. He also never inherited his father's title, Baron Burr. Catherine, now a widow, would spend some time in the company of the Dowager Lady Strickland, Catherine Neville. She was the widow of Catherine's cousin, Sir Walter Strickland and they would reside together at Sizer Castle in Westmoreland, now known as Cumbria. But one year on in 1534, Catherine returned to the altar for her second marriage, this time to John Neville, the third Baron Latimer. It quite possibly wasn't perfect. John was at the time in a state of fiscal decay. He had no money. Mainly due to legal action, he and his brothers took attempting to claim the title Earl of Warwick. But it was slightly more of a win-win situation aside for Catherine, she had now got a home of her own, a title, and a husband with some influence in the northern counties. What could go wrong? Catherine's husband was a supporter of the Catholic Church, and to this end he disputed Henry's right to an annulment against Catherine of Aragon. In October of 1536, the northern uprising would be planted firmly on the doorstep of his property. They came screaming and threatening violence if he refused to join their growing band in reinstating the Catholic links between England and Rome. Catherine could only watch in horror as they dragged her husband away. She now lived alone and in fear. However, Catherine made one choice that she thought would help her ongoing situation, but word had spread that she was supportive of the Church of England, which went down with the public like a lead balloon. In 1537, while she was staying at Snape Castle in Yorkshire, rebels would infiltrate her space and hold her hostage. Her husband was told that if he did not return immediately, his family would be killed. Luckily for Catherine, when John did return, he somehow managed to get the rebels to step down after, I would imagine, some lengthy negotiations. Still, it worked and the Latimers would now find themselves, at least for the time being, in a state of calm. However, the king had heard about the troubles and word spread fast. Latimer was held in conflicting reports. Was he a conspirator or not? If the latter was the case, he would undoubtedly face execution. Step forward the Duke of Norfolk, 
Henry had engaged with him and asked for more information, with one sure way to find out. Latimer must either praise Ask, also known as the villain of the piece, or submit himself to clemency. John Latimer did not fancy a close shave and wholeheartedly complied with the king's wishes. Latimer had managed to escape, but his reputation fell somewhat short of what had been gathered over previous years. Henry was very clever. He got what he wanted, but he always wanted more. Cromwell would use Latimer over the coming years. You could call it blackmail, and no one would argue against it. But after the demise of Cromwell, the Latimers did eventually start to regain some dignity. The sun was shining once again on this family. Visits were done, Catherine to her brother and sister. Her husband would even attend Parliament. The whole atmosphere was changing, not just on the outside world, but at court too. Let's now move forward to 1542. Lord Latimer's health had started to deteriorate and Catherine nursed him through until he died in 1543. For Catherine, she was once again widowed. Still, she had something to fall back on as her husband had left her the manor of Stowe, along with some other properties. As for money, it seems he had recovered from his earlier lack of by leaving some for the welfare and ongoing support of his daughter, and Catherine was allowed a £30 per year income if her daughter would fail to marry within five years. Catherine was now considered rich. She had for the first time scooped the medieval lottery and was now on the way up the royal ladder. She now had new contacts, one being the Lady Mary. A new vibrant friendship would develop between them and by 1543, Catherine was now a part of Mary's household. It was at this moment that Henry set eyes upon her, rubbing his hands. I'm guessing he thought she's the next one for me. However, Catherine was a little besotted by another man, her Sir Thomas Seymour. He was the brother of the late Queen Jane Seymour. Sadly for Thomas, he was shown the door. The king had come knocking and nothing would or could stop Catherine from agreeing to this call. Thomas, well, he was sent on his merry way, removed from court and told to take a vacation in Brussels. The 12th of July 1543 was a big day for Catherine. She was married to Henry at Hampton Court Palace. She was the first Queen of England to become Queen of Ireland after Henry had adopted the title but the couple also shared numerous ancestors, which I'm sure was a riveting chat over dinner. The couple were actually third cousins once removed, which is pretty distant in the themes of ancestry. Catherine set to work on building her entourage now, introducing her former stepdaughter Margaret Neville as her lady-in-waiting. She also gave her stepson's wife Lucy Somerset a place around the table. But apart from this, Catherine was considerably careful on how to manage her new life, she developed a good relationship with Henry's son Edward and made explorative moves on reconciliation between Henry and his daughters. Between July and September in 1544, Henry set out on what would be his last campaign. He left Catherine as regent in a move that would truly help her develop into the role. Her council was made up of sympathetic followers, making handling situations much more comfortable. She virtually took control and led the way on most matters, including provision, finance, and even signed royal proclamations while maintaining a healthy contact with her husband, just in case he might disagree. All this power had been played beautifully by Catherine. It is noted sometime later that Elizabeth I took much inspiration from Catherine and her strength of character that would help define her own rule over the coming years. The one thing that would always be discussed when Catherine's name was mentioned was her religious beliefs. There was much speculation about who she actually concurred with and was she really a Protestant sympathiser who harboured secrets? Stephen Garner, the Bishop of Winchester, and Lord Ryersley, who was the Lord Chancellor, had their doubts. Although brought up and once married to a Catholic, Catherine never lost her sympathies of a Protestant viewpoint. In the last few years, she had veered more towards the faith, introduced by Henry. I wonder why. But by the middle of the 1540s, it said she was a Protestant. This view was seen in action after the death of Henry when she wrote a book entitled The Lamentation of a Sinner. It's doubtful her views came to fruition in the last few years of her marriage to Henry. Catherine indeed held a sympathetic outlook to people such as Anne Askew, who had died for her beliefs in opposition to Catholicism. Stephen Gardner and Lord Ryersley would not go away. In 1546, they were now hell-bent on bringing down this woman. They drew up an arrest warrant. Not only that, but rumours were now flying around the court that Henry was currently pursuing his lucky number seven. This time Catherine's close friend, the Duchess of Suffolk. 
Catherine was one step ahead. She had seen the warrants and instead of just capitulating in front of the king, she gave him a full-on verbal summary of her thoughts. She'd argue that she only came to a point of view to take pressure off the king and to relax his mind against the ongoing ulcerous leg which had developed hugely and now constrained most of his activity. The following day an armed guard approached Catherine as she was out for a walk with Henry and they were completely unaware of the talk the couple had been having and they were sent away in short thrift as only Henry could do. Now literally on his last legs, Henry decided that Catherine should have a provision after his death. She was awarded £7,000 which would more than take her mind off things. Henry also said that Catherine should be known as Queen Dowager and given respect as the Queen of England even though he wouldn't be around to oversee it. Catherine retired from court after Edward was pronounced King on the 31st of January 1547 and she moved to the old manor in Chelsea. What happened to Thomas Seymour, I hear you say? Well, after the passing of Henry, Thomas resurfaced. He'd listened to the news and was chomping at the bit to meet up with his previous love. Catherine was also getting excited at this prospect, even though it had only been a few months since Henry's death. But Thomas knew he would not be able to just turn up and marry Catherine. Council would disapprove. Yet what could this flourishing relationship do about it? Well, they married in secret. And when news broke, it was on every front page of every medieval tabloid. It was a massive risk they had undertaken, and even the new King Edward and Lady Mary were entirely against this duet. Thomas thought he could help alleviate the problem by writing to Mary and asking her to intervene. This was met with much hostility. Mary was not happy, and her fury was in abundance. She claimed it was tasteless and refused any help. She even asked her sister Elizabeth to have nothing to do with Catherine ever again. From being the height of favour to once again a sedate pace throughout these turbulent times, Catherine had problems with her brother-in-law and it wasn't looking good. Edward Seymour was not only the King's uncle, but Lord Protector. An ongoing lull in friendliness between Catherine and Seymour's wife, her former lady-in-waiting Anne Seymour, which brought to question Catherine's ownership of jewels given to her by Henry. Anne said she would no longer be entitled to such things and only the wife of the Protector should indeed be able to wear them. I'm guessing Catherine had little care about the jewels. The Duchess won the argument. However, it would lead to a lasting break within the Seymour family. Thomas claimed it was a personal attack by his brother on him that had caused all the friction and affected his and his wife's social standing. How does one take their mind off troubling family affairs? Of course, get pregnant. In March 1548, Catherine was now 35 and if anything, the pregnancy was certainly a surprise, especially... Catherine had never had any children throughout her life. And just when you thought you'd hear the steps of tiny feet and a loving husband clearly wanting to take care of his wife, it was discovered that Seymour was none of the above. He was actually now seeking the services of Lady Elizabeth. Talk about treading on eggshells. It was reported that Catherine had caught the two of them embracing. Not a great sign. And according to one account by Cat Ashley and before this situation became any worse, Elizabeth was sent away to stay with Sir Anthony Denny at Chessant. Elizabeth would never see her stepmother again, although she tried by correspondence in putting the wrongs right. By June 1548, Catherine had moved to Sudley Castle. She was accompanied by Lady Jane Grey. Catherine was to help educate her. However, time was running out now for Catherine, and it would be her last summer of life. On the 30th of August 1548, Catherine gave birth to a daughter. She was called Mary Seymour, named after her stepdaughter, Mary. But sadness was closing in and on the 5th of September, Catherine died. It's thought she had suffered from childbed fever, a common illness that was mainly due to a lack of hygiene throughout childbirth. On the 7th of September, Catherine would become the first Protestant burial held in England. Her chief mourner was Lady Jane. Catherine was laid to rest within the grounds of Sudley Castle in Gloucestershire. Her husband, Lord Thomas Seymour, was beheaded for treason on the 20th of March. 1549. As for Mary, her daughter, she was taken in by the Dowager Duchess of Suffolk, close friend of Catherine's, and Catherine's jewels, clothing and private papers were all sent to the Tower of London on the 20th of April 1549. It ended up being a tragic end for Catherine. She had come so far in her relatively short life. She had seen the ups and downs of marriage, witnessed death and the fragility of religion. Her finale was cut short, yet however perilous life could have been with Henry, her influence and strategic mind brought her through unscathed. 
This was a woman of sincerity, strength of character, and clearly one of the A-list celebrities of the day.